no witchcraft for sale. The Quars had been childless for years when little Teddy was born. They were touched by the pleasure of their servants who brought presents of fowls and eggs and flowers to the homestead when they came to rejoice over the baby, exclaiming with delight over his downy golden head and his blue eyes. They congratulated Mrs. Farquhar as if she had achieved a very grateful thing, and she felt that she had. Her smile for the lingering, admiring natives was warm and grateful. Later, when Teddy had his first haircut, Gideon, the cook, picked up the soft old puffs from the ground and held them reverently in his hand. And he smiled at the little boy and said, Little Yellowhead. That became the native name for the child. Gideon and Teddy were great friends from the first. When Gideon had finished his work, he would lift Teddy on his shoulders to the shade of a big tree and play with him there, forming the curious little toys from twigs and leaves and grass, or shaping animals from wetted soil. When Teddy learned to walk, it was often Gideon who crouched before him, clucking encouragement, finally catching him when he fell, tossing him up in the air till they both became breathless with laughter. Mrs. Barcour was fond of the old cook because of his love for her child. There was no second baby, and one day Gideon said, Ah, Mrs. Mrs., the Lord above sent this one. Little Yellowhead is the most good thing we have in our house. Because of that we, Mrs. Farquhar felt a warm impulse towards her cook, and at the end of the month she raised his wages. He had been with her now for several years. He was one of the few natives who had his wife and children in the compound and never wanted to go home to his car, to his carl, which was some hundreds of miles away. Sometimes a small pickanin who had been born at the same time as Teddy could be seen peering from the edge of the bush staring in awe at the little white boy with his miraculous fair hair and northern blue eyes. The two little children would gaze at each other with a wide, interested gaze, and once Teddy put his hand out curiously to touch the black child's cheeks and hair. Gideon, who was watching, shook his head wonderingly and said, Ah, Mrs., these are both children, and one will grow up to be a boss, and one will be a servant. And Mrs. Farquhar smiled and said sadly, Yes, Gideon, I was thinking the same. She sighed. It is God's will, said Gideon. He was a mission boy. Farquhars were very religious people, and this shared feeling about God bound servant and masters even closer together. Teddy was about six years old when he was given a scooter and discovered the intoxications of speed. All day he would fly around the homestead, in and out of flower beds, scattering squawking pickens and irritated dogs, finishing with a wide, dizzying arc into the kitchen door. There he would cry, Gideon, look at me! And Gideon would laugh and say, Very clever little yellowhead. Gideon's youngest son, who is now a herds boy, came especially up from the compound to see the scooter. He was afraid to come near it. But Teddy showed off in front of him. Chicken in, shouted Teddy, get out of my way. And he raced in circles around the black child until he was frightened and fled back into the bush. Why did you frighten him? asked Gideon, gravely reproachful. Teddy said defiantly, he's only a black boy, and laughed. Then, when Gideon turned away from him without speaking, his face fell. Very soon he slipped into the house and found an orange and brought it to Gideon, saying, this is for you. He could not bring himself to say he was sorry, but he could not bear to lose Gideon's affection either. Gideon took the orange unwillingly and sighed. Soon you will be going away to school, little yellowhead, he said wonderingly. Then you will be grown up. He shook his head gently and said, and that is how our lives go. He seemed to be putting a distance between himself and Teddy, not because of resentment, but in the way a person accepts something inevitable. The baby had lain in his arms and smiled up into his face. The tiny boy had swung from his shoulders and played with him by the hour. Now Gideon would not let his flesh touch the flesh of the white child. He was kind, but there was a grave formality in the, his voice that made Teddy pout and sulk away. Also, it made him into a man. With Gideon, he was polite and carried himself formally, and if he came into the kitchen to ask for something, it was in the way a white man uses a word uses towards a servant expecting to be obeyed. 
But on the day that Teddy came staggering into the kitchen with his fists in his eyes, shrieking with pain, Gideon dropped the pot full of hot soup he was holding, rushed to the child, and forced aside his fingers. A snake, he exclaimed. Teddy had been on his scooter and had come to arrest and come to arrest with his foot on the side of a big tub of plant. A tree snake, hanging by its tail from the roof, had spat full into his eyes. Mrs. Farquhar came running when she heard the commotion. He'll go blind, she sobbed, holding Teddy close against her. Kitty and he'll go blind. Already the eyes, with perhaps half an hour's sight left in them, were swollen up to the size of fists. Teddy's small white face was distorted by great purple oozing protuberances. Gideon said, wait a minute, Mrs. I'll get some medicine. He ran off into the bush. <clears throat> Mrs. Farquhar lifted the child into the house and bathed his eyes with pomegranate. She had scarcely heard Gideon's words, but when she saw her remedies had no effect at all and remembered how she had seen natives with no sight in their eyes because of the spitting of a snake, she began to look for the return of her cook remembering what she had heard in the, in the efficiency of native herbs. She stood by the window, holding the terrified, sobbing little boy in her, hand, in her arm, and peered helplessly into the bush. It was not more than a few minutes before she saw Gideon come bounding back, and in his hand he held a plant. Do not be afraid, Mrs. said Gideon. This will cure little Yellowhead's eyes. He stripped leaves from the plant, leaving a small white fleshy root. Without even washing it, he put the root in his mouth, chewed it vigorously, and then held the spittle there while he took the child forcibly from Mrs. Farquhar. He gripped Teddy down between his knees and pressed the balls of his thumbs into the swollen eyes so that the child screamed and Mrs. Farquhar cried out in protest, Gideon, Gideon! But Gideon took no notice. He knelt over the writhing child, pushing back the puffy lids till chinks of eyeball showed, and then he spat hard again and again into the into the first one eye and then the other and finally he lifted Teddy gently into his mother's arms and said his eyes will get better but mrs farquhar was weeping with terror and she could hardly thank him it was impossible to believe that teddy could keep his sight in a couple of hours the swelling were gone the eyes were inflamed and tender but teddy could see mr and mrs farquhar went to gideon in the kitchen and thanked him over and over again they felt helpless because of their gratitude it seemed they could do nothing to express it they gave gideon presents for his wife and children and a big increase in wages but these things could not pay for teddy's now completely cured eyes mrs farquhar said gideon god chose you as an instrument for his goodness and gideon said yes mrs god is very good now when such a thing happens on a farm, it cannot be long before everyone hears of it. Mr. and Mrs. Farquhar told their neighbors the story, and the story was discussed from one end of the district to the other. The bush is full of secrets. No one can live in Africa, or at least on the veld, without learning very soon that there is an ancient wisdom of leaf and soil and season, and, too, perhaps most important of all, the darker tracts of the human mind, which is the black man's heritage up and down the district people were telling anecdotes reminding each other of things that had happened to them but i saw it myself i tell you it was a puff adder bite the kaffir's arm was swollen to the elbow like a great shiny black bladder he was groggy after half a minute he was dying then suddenly a kaffir walked out of the bush with his hands full of green stuff he smeared something on the place and the next day my boy was back at work all you could see was two small punctures in the skin this was the kind of tale they told, and, as always, with a certain amount of exasperation, because while all of them knew that in the bush of Africa are waiting valuable drugs locked in bark and simple-looking leaves and in roots, it was impossible to ever get the truth about them from the natives themselves. The story eventually reached town, and perhaps it was a sundowner party, or some such function, that a doctor, who happened to be there, challenged it. Nonsense, he said. These things get exaggerated in the telling. We're always checking up on this kind of story, and we draw a blank every time. Anyway, one morning there arrived a strange car at the homestead, and out stepped one of the workers from the laboratory in town with cases full of test tubes and chemicals. Mr. and Mrs. Farquhar were flustered and pleased and flattered. They asked the scientist to lunch, 
and they told the story all over again for the hundredth time. Little Teddy was there, too, his blue eyes sparkling with health, to prove the truth of it. The scientist explained how humanity might benefit if this new drug could be offered for sale, and the Farquhars were even more pleased. They were kind, simple people who liked to think of something good coming about because of them. But when the scientists began talking of the money that it might result, their manner showed discomfort. The feelings over the miracle, that was how they thought of it, were so strong and deep and religious that it was distasteful for them to think of the money. The scientist, seeing their faces, went back to his first point, which was the advancement of humanity. He was, perhaps, a trifle perfunctionary. It was not the first time he had come salting to the tale of a fabulous bush secret. Eventually, when the meal was over, the Farquhars called Gideon into their living room and explained to him that this boss here was a big doctor from the big city, and he had come all that way to see Gideon. At this, Gideon seemed afraid. He did not understand, and Mrs. Farquhar explained quickly that it was because of the wonderful thing he had done with Teddy's eyes that the big boss had come. Gideon looked from Mrs. Farquhar to Mrs. F Mr. Farquhar and then at the little boy who was showing great importance because of the occasion. At last, he said grudgingly, the big boss wanted to know what medicine I used. He spoke incredulously, as if he could not believe his old friends could so betray him. Mr. Farquhar began explaining how useful medicine could be made out of the root and how it could be put on sale and how thousands of people, black and white, up and down the continent of Africa, could be saved by the medicine when the spitting snake filled their eye with poison. Gideon listened, his eyes bent on the ground, the skin of his forehead puckering in discomfort. When Mr. Farquhar had finished, he did not reply. The scientist, who all this time had been leaning back in a chair, sipping his coffee and smiling with a skeptical good humor, chipped in and explained all over again in different words about the making of drugs and the process of science. He also offered Gideon a present. There was silence after this further explanation, and then Gideon remarked indifferently that he could not remember the root. His face was sullen and hostile, even when he looked at the Farquhars, whom he usually treated like old friends. They were beginning to feel annoyed, and this, this annulled the guilt that had been sprung into life by Gideon's accusing manner. They were beginning to feel that he was unreasonable, but it was at that moment that they all realized he would never give in. The magical drug would remain where it was, unknown and useless except for the tiny scattering of Africans who had the knowledge, natives who might be digging in a ditch for the municipality in a ragged shirt and a pair of pat shorts, but who were still born to healing, heredity healers, being nephews or sons of the old witch doctors whose ugly masks and bits of bone and all the uncouth properties of magic were outward signs of real power and wisdom. Farquhars might tread on that plant fifty times a day as they passed from house to garden, from cow to corral to mealy field, but they would never know it. They went on persuading and arguing with all the force of their exasperation, and Gideon continued to say that he could not remember, or that there was no such root, or that it was the wrong season of the year, or that it wasn't the root itself, but the spit from his mouth that had cured Teddy's eyes. He said all these things, one after another, and they seemed not to care that they were contradictory. He was rude and stubborn, and the Farquhars could hardly recognize their gentle, lovable old servant and this ignorant, perversively obstinate African standing there in front of them with his lowered eyes, his hands twitching, his cook's apron repeating over and over whichever one of the stupid refusals that first entered his head. And suddenly, he appeared to give in. He lifted his head and gave a long, blank, angry look at the circle of whites who seemed to circle him, who seemed to him like a circle of yelping dogs pressing around him, and said, I'll show you the route. They walked single file away from the homestead down a calf path. It was a blazing December afternoon, with a sky full of hot rain and clouds. Everything was hot. The sun was like a bronze tray whirling overhead. There was a heat shimmer over the field. The soil was scorching underfoot, and the dusty wind blew gritty and thick and warm in their faces. It was a terrible day, fit only for reclining on a veranda with iced drinks, which is where they would normally have been at that hour. From time to time, remembering that on the day, th the day of the snake, 
it had taken ten minutes to find the route someone asked is it much further gideon and gideon would answer over his shoulder with angry politeness i'm looking for the route boss and indeed he would frequently bend sideways and trail his hand along the grass with a gesture that was insulting in its perfunctoriness he walked them through the bush along unknown paths for two hours in that melting destroying heat so that the sweat trickled coldly down them and their heads ached they were all quite silent the farquhars because they were angry the scientist because he was being proved right again there was no such plant his was a tactful silence at last six miles from the house gideon suddenly decided that they had had enough or perhaps his anger had evaporated at that moment he picked up without an attempt at looking at anything but a casual handful of blue flowers from the grass flowers that had been growing plentiful all down the path that they had come he handed them to the scientist without looking at him and marched off by himself on the way home leaving them to follow him if they chose when they got back to the house the scientist went to the kitchen to thank gideon he was being very polite even though there was an amused look in his eye gideon was not there throwing the flowers casually at the back of the car eminent visitor departed on his way back to the laboratory gideon was back in his kitchen in time to prepare dinner but he was sulking he spoke to mr farquhar like an unwilling servant it was days before they liked each other again the farquhars made inquiries about the route from their laborers sometimes they were answered with distressful stares sometimes the native said we do not know we have never heard of the route once the cattle boy who had been with them a long time and had grown to trust them a little said ask your boy in the kitchen now there's a doctor for you he's the son of a famous medicine man who used to be in these parts and there's nothing he cannot cure and then he added politely of course he's not as good as the white man's doctor we know that but he's good for us after some time when the soreness had gone from between the far corners and gideon they began to joke what are you going to show us that snake root gideon and he would laugh and shake his head saying a little uncomfortably but i did show you missus have you forgotten much later teddy as a schoolboy would come into the kitchen and say you old rascal gideon do you remember that time you tricked us all by making us walk miles all over the vale for nothing it was so far my father had to carry me and gideon would double up with polite laughter and after much laughing he would suddenly straighten himself up wipe his old eyes and look sadly at teddy who was grinning mischievously at him across the kitchen ah little yellowhead how you have grown soon you will be grown up with a farm of your own